Hello everyone, welcome to Berry Fun Adventures episode 13. I'm Tanya and I'm coming to you from southeast Minnesota where my family and I run Firefly Berries, which is a fruit farm that specializes in pick-your-own strawberries, Concord grapes, and naturally dyed yarn. So thanks so much for joining me. It has been about two weeks since I last put out an episode and I'm super excited to share with you all the things that I have been working on. I have been making a lot. I have been knitting some, but also doing some other making as well that I'm going to share with you. So to start off with what I'm wearing, um, I am wearing, it is a Hohi Locatelli day. If anybody, if you have been here before to the channel, you will know that I love patterns by Hohi Locatelli. She's probably my favorite designer. I love her aesthetic. I love the way she writes the patterns and I love how they knit up. So both of the things I'm wearing today are by Hohi. The first one is called The Girl from the Grocery Store. And it is a shawl. It's quite long. It's kind of asymmetrical, I'd say. Yeah, it's asymmetrical. Had to think about that for a second. This is made in Very Fun Yarns uh, Yak Sock, which is this darker color, this dusty rose. And then the lighter peach color here is actually uh, Jewel Fingering, which is Berry Fun Yarns um, MCN base. So 80% Superwash Merino, 10% Cashmere, and 10% Nylon. So it's a very simple shawl with, uh, you start with the striping. So you start way back at this end. And then as you get to the very end, you add in the eyelets, eyelet rows at the end. So that is the girl from the grocery store shawl. And the sweater I am wearing is my Manzanilla sweater by Hohi. And I have showed this before. It has the fun cable down the side. It is one of my oldest sweaters, but I love it so much. And this past week I had a bit of a sweater emergency because my I love pullovers the most and three of my wool pullovers had holes in them and it had started where I had just had a hole in one and I kind of set it aside and I thought oh I'll do that later I'll mend it later and then it started to pile up and pretty soon I didn't have any sweaters to wear so the other two um, one was actually a Shetland wool sweater that I found at Goodwill and it was just in the seam up in the shoulder so it was really easy to fix so that was my fix number one and fix number two was a um, in the knee in the knees in the arm knee in the elbow area <clears throat> it had a hole in and I had to fix it and that was pretty simple that was my gray sweater I think that was the Malin pullover by Isabel Kramer I know I've showed that before but this one needed the most work on the ribbing of the cuff it had started to fray kind of along the edge here. And I think it's just because, you know, wear of, of using it. And this one being one of my earlier sweaters, I knitted in Cascade 220 Superwash D. Um, it's a worsted, but it, it knits up more like a DK. Anyway, it, it stretched so much and I didn't understand gauge as well then that I have to put it in the dryer in order for it to shrink back up after I wash it. And I don't put it in the dryer very long, but I think that has just made it wear a little faster. Well, anyway, the edges of one of my, I had already replaced one, but the edge of the other one had started to fray and just basically just wear away. It was just, there was nothing wrong with it. I didn't have any critters or anything eating it. It just was wearing away. The wool was getting thin. So what I decided to do, and then also my elbows were getting thin, I did not have, because I had repaired it before, I did not have any more scraps of this particular yarn. And even if I did, it has, the color has faded a lot and I don't think it would have matched. So what I ended up doing is I took some Malabrigo and if I, you can kind of see it's different, obviously. The Malabrigo is a little bit thicker and it's a single ply, but it was pretty close. So what I did, even though I didn't need to, I ripped out both. Sorry about the, the lighting there. It's getting a little crazy in my... I ripped out both so that I could... 
there we go, so that I could have matching. And then in the elbows, I made little patches. And I wasn't quite sure at first, I thought I was just gonna do some visible mending, but because of the way that the pattern is, you know, you it's knit sideways like this with um, the garter ridges every once in a while. It just didn't look right. It looked kind of wonky. So I decided to make a patch that mimicked the patterning. And then I just put it on here. So I have one on each of my elbows. It's not perfect, but now I can wear it. And I don't have to worry about it wearing through. It'll probably be my around the house, work outside kind of sweater, but I love it and it's super cozy. So I was very excited to have that fixed. So Manzanilla by Hohi Locatelli. I finished something since I saw you last, actually. Uh, the first thing I finished, I'm gonna have to put a picture in here for you because I already gifted them to my son for his birthday. He turned 18 yesterday. And it is a pair of vanilla socks that I knit out of the Patton's Croy yarn that I talked about on last episode. I was striping, I had like three 50 gram balls and it's a little bit heavier weight, it's sport weight. So I was using the blue for the heel, toe and cuff. And then I was using the other two colors that, are, that were very similar. I was alternating every two rounds. So they turned out great. They fit him great, and uh, that was a, a success there. So the second thing is my drum roll, my Fade Neve. I finally finished my Fade Neve sweater. So I'm gonna hold it up in all its glory. I got the sleeves done. Last time I came to you, I think I had like maybe part of one sleeve done. And it was just a matter of me just sitting down and knitting on it. I just, I don't know, I had reached the point, I wanted it to be done, I was tired of bobbles, I just wanted to knit on a sweater, not like bobble every 10 rounds. So I just started doing a little bit each day and then once, what really helped is once I finished sleeve number one, it was sleeve number two went so much faster because then I didn't have to stop and measure it every every so many so many rows to try it on because I have really long arms, I've talked about that before, my gorilla arms. I have really long arms and so often what it says you're supposed to knit it to in the pattern, it is not what I have to knit mine to. So I like to try it on to get it just right and I also didn't want to make it super long, uh, partly because I was running out of yarn. I played yarn chicken, I had about this, my ball was about this big left, tiny. It was maybe eight grams or something of the blue under the sea. And so I wanted it to be long enough, but not super long, because I knew the yarn would stretch, it's super wash. So all that to say, let me give you the details on what I knitted out of. The pattern is by Andrea Mowry, Fade Neve, and it is knit out of very fun yarns, All Star DK. And I apologize that probably this bright color is gonna blow out a little bit. The first color, let's see, there we go. This one here is Fairy Garden. It's kind of a minty green, and that fades into kind of a green variegated. It's got some darker pops in there. Um, and this one does not have a name. It was kind of a one of a kind, but I'm gonna try and recreate it. The darker one is Steamed Asparagus, which is dyed with red onion skins. And then the last color is Under the Sea, which is Marigold's cochineal, logwood, and then an over dye in indigo. So I followed the pattern pretty much exactly like it was written. I, I can't remember if I, if I did any modifications. I can't, I, the neckline was perfect actually. I love the neckline. I think I did a size two and I will link the pattern, my pattern page below so you can see if I had added any notes or anything. I always tend to go down a needle size or two compared to what the pattern says just because I'm a loose knitter but otherwise I think I followed it pretty closely but I'll put a picture in of me wearing it here if I can get one taken in time before I upload this just so you can see what it looks like on me but it fit really well and I'm very happy with it so the Fade Neve by Andrea Mowry and then a couple other things that I worked on that I finished that were not knitting. 
Uh, my mom visited this weekend, and I haven't seen my parents in person since July of last year because of COVID. So it's been a very long time. My mom is, I can't, I come from an artistic family. My father was a, before he retired, he was a painter, an artist working on the big billboards that you see on the roads. Before we had computers and digital stuff, he actually would hand sketch the drawings and then he would project them up onto the big billboards and uh, paint them. After technology came around, he started to do more on computers, but my mother is a very good sewist. And so when I was probably eight or nine, I learned to sew very basic things, but I haven't really sewn a ton since then. But I really wanted, I had some material and some things cut out and I had gotten a new sewing machine last February before all the chaos of COVID. And I wanted to learn how to do zippers on my new, on my new um, sewing machine. Obviously zippers are not that hard, but I just, I was nervous about doing it the first time by myself. So my mom helped me and we made two project bags. The first one is this cute little sock size bag with the butterflies. I put my zipper in there. I think I did pretty good. And then the inside is the kind of just a fun reddish pink color. And I have a pair of socks in there, but I have a knit on the sock, so I'm not going to show you those, but that's the first one I made. And then I made a bigger one. You can tell I like nature because I have a lot of nature bags. This one with butterflies. And the inside of this one, so this, this was my very first one, so my zipper stitching isn't quite as good. And this one has kind of a gold shimmery fabric on the inside. What I did learn is that I think the bigger bags I definitely want to line. I did not line this one, which is fine. I don't care, it's just for me, but um, I think I will put some lining in the next ones that I make. So that's kind of fun. I was needing a new project bag that was a little bit bigger. I have my husband's um, sweater that I talked about a while back in here that I have not done anything on yet. So I'm maybe I'm feeling, since I got my sweater done, I have a new bag that I might be motivated to start up his sweater too. But I haven't decided entirely. So those are my finished objects. And then as far as other works in progress that I've been working on, really only two things I have been, have been on my needles. Uh, the first one is my Musselberg hat. Oh. Before I tell you that, I also knit, I also sewed, here's another finished object. I sewed some yarn cake cozies. Maybe you have seen these. You put them around your um, yarn cakes to kind of keep them from falling apart. So I sewed a few of those and some of those will probably go in the shop. Those are kind of fun. These are llamas with like little Mexican blankets on them. So this is my Musselberg hat by Isolde Teague, the pattern. And it doesn't look like much right now. It looks like a big tube or like a big, I think of it like sort of like one of those little cocoons for babies. But how the pattern works is you cast on at the top and then you knit this big, basically like a big tube. And then when you're all done, you take the tube, I'll turn it the other way to show you, and you push it in and you have a double thickness hat. So let me see if I have, the, oh I do, I have the pattern in here. Let me show you a picture real quick. I am knitting the adult medium size on fingering weight yarn. It's a picture. And um, it's going fine. I have to say that I have not been super enjoying it because um, not because the yarn, the yarn is fine. The yarn is very fun yarns, uh, very tough sock, 80% 80, 80 merino, 20% nylon, and it's in a one-of-a-kind colorway I dyed with hibiscus flowers. Um, and the yarn is fine and it's it's knitting up nicely. It's not pooling too much. It has some uh, pretty blue and, and grayish brown colors, but it's just, it's all knitting, 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 and it just was kind of, I was getting bored with it, even to knit while I watched a movie was seeming too boring. So I started to knit it while I was 
um, I was going to say, while I was reading a book, um, some young adult books that I'm reading with my children. And so I'll talk about those later in the classroom. But then I was like, okay, I don't have to think about it at all. I can actually read. I can get some of my homework done. And that was making it go faster. But I, I think I'm, I'm over halfway done. I think I have to knit like maybe like 18 inches from here to here before I start to decrease. Something like that. I can't remember exactly. But the pattern itself is actually great for any thickness of yarn. I'm doing it in fingering, but it has um, gauge. It gives you like the size that you want. So it tells you like circumference of hat that you want. And then um, gives you like, if your gauge is seven stitches per inch, then this is how many stitches. Or if it's five stitches per inch, this is how many. So it's a really great pattern. It is a pay for pattern on Ravelry, but I think it is worth it because it does give you so many options as far as what kind of yarn you could use with it. And you could, you know, you could make it even a scrappy hat and just, you know, use up your scraps that you had. Next time I make it, I don't know if I'll do a fingering weight again because it goes kind of slow. I might try like a DK weight or a sport weight. So yeah, that's the Musselberg hat by Isolde Teague. <clears throat> and that is in my balls, balls, balls bag. That's an Aaron Lane bag I got as a gift from my friend Jen, which I love. And the other thing, the other thing I have been working on is actually something I ripped out. I had started it quite a while ago. I want to say October of last year. And I had started it on, <clears throat> excuse me, I started it on double pointed needles, size zero. And they, it just seemed like the gauge was really tight and I was not enjoying it. The yarn is kind of a, it's a one of a kind. It's really pretty. I got it in Canberra, Australia, when I was traveling with my husband in 2019 at a little yarn shop there. I think it was called like Wool Shop at Manuka. I can't remember. I'll link it below. Anyway, it was a cute little shop and it was actually hand dyed by one of the ladies who worked there. And so I got it, but, and it is say it's 400 yards. It's hundred percent superwash merino and it was supposed to be 400 yards per hundred grams. However, it's got an interesting twist on it. It's very, it's a very plump 400 yards to 100 grams. And so it just was kind of, I don't know, it was really tight and I was hating it, knitting it. So I pulled out some nine inch circular chow gu needles, which I have just gotten in stock and they should be up on the site soon. And I had tried the wooden ones, but I prefer the metal ones because the wooden ones at the tinier circumference size they just break too easily. So um, I do not carry the bamboo tiny nine inch circulars. I only carry the stainless steel. And I believe this is a size zero, but I am making the go-to fingerless gloves. And this is a free pattern by Donna Kimball and it is on Ravelry and it's really simple I think it's a knit three purl two pattern and you pretty much do it all the way up the hand and it just sort of fits real snug and then you have a thumb gusset um, as you get up there but it is much more enjoyable with the nine inch circulars it's going much faster so I ripped everything out I actually was into the thumb gusset I probably had I don't know a good five inches because I like to make the um, cuff a little bit longer on my fingerless mittens so yeah, so I ripped it all out and I, I restarted and it's going much faster. So that is probably the one that I am enjoying knitting on the most right now is this. However, I have to get my Musselberg hat done because I promised I twin, I'm twinning with somebody for Zombie Knit Apocalypse 2021. We're having a knit along and I'm twinning with someone, so I need to get that done for sure by the end of April. So what I've been doing is kind of between these two projects, if I'm not um, doing sewing or beading or something else, I will 
do so many rows on the muscle burk hat and then I will do some on my fingerless gloves. So yeah, so that's it. Let me see what else I wrote down here. That's it for what I've been working on. It's been pretty, pretty low key. As far as in the pots, I have some exciting, th exciting things that are coming. I am hoping I have been working a lot with the kids and with school and finishing some of these projects So I and my parents visiting. So I haven't had a chance to die yet. However, it is on the schedule for tomorrow and I don't plan on uploading this video until the weekend. So probably Friday, April 2nd, this will go up. So I will hopefully be able to get a little video footage of some of the dyeing that I'm going to be doing this weekend. But I'm hoping to get most of the first installment of Lincoln's Littles. So the 20 gram mini, mini set that I was telling you about last time. The first installment will be about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And Lincoln, my nine-year-old son, will be helping me with those. So we'll be working on those probably tomorrow, Friday, and then through the weekend. And I'm not sure when they'll go live. It will kind of depend. I know some of the colors we need to do some over dyeing or work with indigo. So it needs to be a little bit warmer out so we can have that pot going outside. So hopefully, I think we're supposed to hit 71 on Monday. So if that is the case, we will be able to do some work outside. But that's um, number one on the list for in the pots. And then number two is that the uh, countdown to the holidays kit will go, the pre-order for that will go live on Friday, April 2nd. And that will be sort of like an advent. You could call it an advent kit if you want to. You can just, if you don't celebrate Christmas, it could be a countdown to whatever winter holiday that you celebrate, or maybe just a fun countdown, I don't know, to whatever you want. <clears throat> You could open them all at the same time if you really wanted to. I won't be there and I won't be judging you. You do whatever you want to do. But it will be a kit with 12 20 gram mini skeins as well as at least four other fun goodies to go with. So some of those will be directly from our farm here. So other things that we make or grow that I can share with you for uh, little gifts along the way. And some of them will be from other Minnesota makers that I love that I want to share with you. So I'm still kind of working out the details. I'm thinking it's going to be four or five, but if I have a lot of fun, it may end up being a few more goodies than that. So that will be the pre-orders for that will go up April 2nd and I will keep them up through probably April 30th. And then if I have interest, I may put up more pre-orders, but so we'll kind of see how that goes. But the theme that I'm going with as far as colors, if you're thinking about coloring colors and what sorts of things that I will be using for dyes, I'm going to do a Christmas at the farm theme. So things that remind me of experiences our family has during the holiday season at the farm. And I'm in anticipating the ideas I have in my head will be if you're wondering like more pastel-y or darker probably more jewel toned colors is what I'm seeing in my head but that's about the only hint I can give you but it will be a fun kit and I'm excited to do that this year and to get those out to you and those will ship in early November um, and the pricing that you see on the site when they go live it does include shipping the only thing is that if you are an international order, the shipping may be a bit more and I will contact you directly for that. Sorry about that, I had to step away for a second. I had a cat trying to enter the room and he is actually very good at it. He, he can actually open doors and so he bangs on the handle until you open the door for him. Anyway, so that is in the pots and I'm, ex I'm really excited to die to get back into dyeing and I know I've said that a couple times and then I haven't had a lot to show you yet and that's really just because I am kind of trying to wrap up my school year with the boys and uh, for those of you who don't know I homeschool my my four boys and so I'm trying to kind of wrap up some of that and not try to do too much at the same time so I've only been uh, allowing myself to do dye and very fun yarns work 
for the most part on the weekends or in the afternoons, but mostly on the weekends just to separate it out so I don't feel too overwhelmed. And with my parents visiting last week, of course, I spent time with them instead. So there will be more coming and it will be fun and exciting and I can't wait to share it with you. So thanks for, for waiting along with me. So the last two things I wrote down today for in the classroom, uh, in the classroom I didn't have a ton to share with you except to say that, uh, to put a plug out there for young adult books, even for adults. When I went to school to be an English teacher in the late 90s, the whole genre of young adult books didn't really, it was just starting to come, come around. There were children's books and there were adult books. And this idea of a young adult section is really awesome because I think it is great for the kids, of course, because those older kids, the high school aged kids, late middle school, they have this kind of bridge. The topics are a little more intense and you can kind of talk about more serious things, but yet they're not adult books. And they're also appealing to adults because they're a quicker read, but yet they're still interesting. So. In my own personal opinion, I would have to say the whole Harry Potter series is what kind of catapulted young adult genre in general. All that to say that's a lot of gibberish about my whole geeky English literature personality is to say that I have been, for school, we've been reading a couple different books. I've been revisiting some classics with my older boys, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee and the um, the Golden Compass or his Dark Materials series by Philip Pullman with my middle schooler. So those two have been really, those are two of my more favorite books slash series that I have read and have been enjoying those with my kids. So if you haven't read either of those, take a look at those. And then, um, what's the other one? The other one that I've been reading, I had to write down the author's name. It's called A Place to Belong, and it's by Cynthia Kadohata, and she is a Japanese, I believe, writer, or at least she has some heritage of that. <clears throat> I'm not sure if she's from America or not, but anyway, her story, this one I'm reading with my eighth grader, and that story is about Japan post-World War II, and the girl in the story is a young girl probably 12, 13, I'm thinking. Hanoka, I think is her name. And she and her family were put into the internment camps during World War II and then ended up being shipped back to Japan after World War II to go back to life there. So it's it's post-World War II and she actually lives in the book near Hiroshima. So it's been, it's a good book to, to kind of give an experience of what that might have been like to live there at that time. So I would say it's definitely historical fiction. My son and I are reading it. Um, he is kind of at that area in history, world history, but also geography. He's studying Japan. So it was a good fit for us to read the book together. So it's been a very enjoyable read, uh, very, very eye-opening and a different perspective that I have never had before. So that's called A Place to Belong. So yeah, so in the classroom, just check out some really good, those are young adult books are great for this time of year too, as it starts to get warmer and you want something a little shorter and not super heavy. Although all that said, the Golden Compass and the His Dark Materials series can be pretty heavy. Uh, but they're a quick read and, and, you know, interesting, keep your interest. So that is in the classroom. And then in the kitchen, the favorite recipe I want to share with you today is for homemade granola. I don't know if any of you all are granola eaters, but it used to be a recipe. Uh, you know, it used to be something that was considered health food. But now when you go shopping in the grocery store, you can get granola that has tons of sugar on. It has Sometimes it even has like chocolate chips in it and all that kind of stuff, which is fine and, you know, great every once in a while to have a little treat for yourself, but it's also really nice to have the granola that is a little bit healthier. 
So we make a homemade granola, mostly because it's, one, it's good for you, but then also I don't have to worry so much if my kids eat a ton of it. I know that for the most part it's pretty healthy for them. So I have a recipe. I can't remember the author's name at the moment, but I got it a long time ago out of a book from her. I'll see if I can find it online. If not, I will, um, I'll put it below with my modifications that I make. But it is cooked at a very low temperature in the oven and it has oats in it. You can put nuts in it if you're not allergic to nuts of various kinds. We put sometimes, we put uh, pumpkin seeds in it. You could put, it also has coconut in it. And then the sweetener, I use a combination of raw honey, which we have on our farm. We have beehives. And then some pure maple syrup. And then it has some coconut oil in it. So you get that like really good coconut taste to it. And it doesn't take very long. It cooks at a pretty low temperature. I want to say it's about 45 or 50 minutes in the oven. And you just have to stir it every once in a while so that it browns evenly and it doesn't burn. But super yummy. I think I made a double batch a couple of weeks ago since I last podcast. And it, it made like 20 cups of granola, not even exaggerating, 20 cups. And I think my family ate it in like four days. So it's very popular. We eat it with milk or if you like to eat yogurt, you can put it on top of yogurt. Um, I sometimes like to eat it just dry as well. But anyway, granola, that is my in the kitchen recipe for you for this week. So I think that's it. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope to add a little bit of that video that I was talking about as far as what's going on in the dye pots. And I got a noisy cat behind me. Uh, so I hope to add a little bit more of what's going on in the dye pots as well as as we get into May. If you are in the Rochester area, you will be able to find me set up at the Rochester Farmer's Market. So that will be exciting. I'll have some new things to show you about that as well. So until next time, take care, everyone. I hope you are all staying healthy and getting your COVID vaccines. And I look forward to chatting again in a couple weeks. Take care. Bye-bye.